We return now to the Trump administration's latest sanctions against Russia. John Yang has that. Judy, to explain these new sanctions against 17 Russian government officials and seven of Russia's richest men, we turn to special correspondent Ryan Chilcote reporting tonight from London. Ryan, thanks for joining us. What makes these sanctions different from the sanctions that are already in place? Well, these sanctions are very hard hitting. And in uh, contrast to the sanctions we've seen before, these go after some Russian billionaires specifically and exclusively for their ties, or at least they appear to, exclusively for their ties to President Vladimir Putin. So in the past, uh, the Trump administration, the Obama administration has sought to have a link between a specific event, whether it's the annexation of Crimea, whether it was fighting in the East, eastern Ukraine, and the individual they were sanctioning. But in this case, it's proximity to the Kremlin. Another change is that very early on, we saw what they called sectoral sanctions. Uh, sectors of the Russian economy were sort of sanctioned uh, to try and put pressure on those sectors, the oil industry. In this case, very targeted, going after people that, at least in Washington, D.C., they think are close to President Putin. Some of these people are close to President Putin. Tell us about them. What are, who are some of the names who, who, that jump off the list at you? Well, Oleg Deripaska is definitely uh, top of the list, uh, the most interesting of the individuals that has been sanctioned. He's worth about $7 billion. He has global business interests. He's well known in the United States as having a business relationship with Paul Manafort. Uh, many people uh, in the U.S. suspect that he may have acted as some kind of intermediary between uh, the Trump administration um, and the Kremlin. He has denied that. Uh, so he's uh, definitely interesting. Big time businessman, Victor Vexelberg, another uh, worth about $16 billion, former oil man, also uh, in the metals industry. Interesting choice uh, because, in some ways, he's been behind the drive more recently to diversify the Russian economy away from oil and gas. He's a huge fan of the United States. He's a big investor in Silicon Valley. And he's been trying to kind of, uh, you know, help uh, Russia with his money uh, turn the corner from being a, a, a petrodollar state, if you will. So interesting that he has been targeted. Again, of course, the idea is that he's uh, somehow close to uh, President Putin. And finally, the third person I would point out out of the two dozen would be Kirill Shamalov. He is the former son-in-law of Vladimir Putin. I say former because he was married to Vladimir Putin's daughter, one of his daughters, but they are now divorced. And uh, the uh, Treasury is saying that he effectively benefited from uh, that marriage. And because of that and the proximity to the Russian president, he should be sanctioned. How likely are these sanctions to succeed to actually change Putin's behavior? I don't think they're very likely to succeed in changing Vladimir Putin's behavior at all. Um, there was a very interesting comment from the Russian president's spokesman the other day where he said, oligarch sanctions, what oligarch sanctions? We don't have oligarchs in Russia. Uh, and, you know, uh, in one sense, that sounds laughable uh, that he's making light of this. But in fact, there is some truth in what he's saying. There are no real oligarchs in Russia in the sense that there are people that can exercise power or influence on Vladimir Putin. Uh, Russian billionaires, Russian oligarchs, if you want to call them that, they may enjoy their wealth at the pleasure of, of President Putin, if you will, but they can't force him to change his behavior. And so the idea that of putting sanctions on them will, and they get upset and then go to President Putin to say, you know, don't do X, I don't think that's going to work. On the one hand, you've got these new sanctions. On the other, you have President Trump calling Vladimir Putin to congratulate him on his election, talking about inviting him to the White House for a summit. What message is this sending the Russians? In the Kremlin, they decided a long time ago that President Trump is uh, politically impotent, as the Russian prime minister put it once. Uh, they believe that all of these actions he's taking uh, against Russia are because he has to, because of political pressure that's being exerted on him. And they uh, see that it, despite uh, their hopes uh, and their, 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 uh, their, their confidence in, in President Trump, they see that the relationship is on a downward spiral, and, and that definitely is not something that they're very happy about. That said, they are hopeful that at some point, uh, you know, politics is a crazy thing, maybe he will have 
more power, and he will be able to, if not improve the relationship, stop its deterioration. Special Correspondent Ryan Chilcote from London, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure.